going to disclose all of it, I think, in a book. But before any of that could come out, uh, you know, she had this sudden mysterious death. And there were reports of men in her apartment that same night, who knows who they were, taking out documents of manuscripts and so on and so forth. And that information never saw the light of day. What we can do now and what we do do now to protect ourselves is media like this. We can instantly deliver an ebook or printed book to Amazon. We can have media that reaches around the world instantly. And so we are protected. Uh, we're not as, um, as much at risk as people like uh, her were back in the 60s. So the information flow has changed totally, which protects us who are the sources. So I think we're in a really good position to, uh, to, to find, research, locate, and disseminate this information with minimal risk to us. So that's, that's again, and I, I commend all the listeners of shows like this, and I, I commend uh, the, the, uh, the uh, media personalities that uh, have put together these large syndicated talk shows because they have provided a platform for distribution of information which is would have been unheard of decades ago and which was not existent back in that time frame way back. Uh, and that's why those people were in so much risk, personal risk uh, and so forth. So uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape today. We, we've got it made, I think. Yeah, um, my, speaking of the uh, blank, blank, blank is what my mother would say. <laughs> Um, I, I met her old boss, uh, George H. Bush, and I worked at ABC, uh, and he was vice president of the United States at the time. And I told him, my mother worked under you when you were director. And he said, oh, yeah, what's your name? Okay, Gene Morgan. Oh, okay. He autographed a card, gave me the card. I gave it to my mother. And some years ago, I said, Mom, where's that picture, you, uh, that card I gave you from uh, George Bush? Well, I put it with the picture what picture and here's a picture of her with him giving her an award in central intelligence and she had other pictures of other directors also giving her awards at central intelligence so i was like i guess he did know her but when i was talking to him he made some comment about you know if the american people knew what we had done they'd run us out of town on a rail tarred and feathered had no idea what that was, and I wasn't going to jeopardize my security clearance for a White House clearance, Capitol Gallery pass, and TZ police pass by asking him the question, what are you talking about? You know, because it must have been something serious. And I, when we talked about this, I told you that what uh, I think happened in the, in the motorcade during the Kennedy assassination. And and based on something that my mother had me doing when I was younger. And I could see the same thing going on in the, in the front seat of that car. And all the things point to the fact that it was obviously, this was a major hit. All the shooters missed and, and the driver took the fatal shot. But nobody's gonna accept that because they're saying, oh no, the Secret Service gonna have done that, they wouldn't have done that, da 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 da. And the excuse they gave about why Kennedy reached up to his throat, he got shot from the front because tr pain travels at the speed of a bullet to the brain. The brain cuts off most other sensory input to keep it from going into shock. He reached for where he felt the pain, which was at his throat. And th that wasn't a magic bullet that hit him from the back. And the driver turned around not once, not twice, but three times when his passenger, which is his boss, turned around once in tandem with the driver to block his view. But he sat there. JFK. And then. Yeah. 
details and nobody this man was set up and he was one of our clandestine organizations anyway yeah it had to be cia from start to finish and here's what i think uh, just to give you a few quote bullet points of my own like yours uh like i say my stepfather john stringer took the jfk autopsy photos at bethesda and um But I, the single most important piece of, well, there's two. Uh, the summer before the assassination. It was It proved that they knew that old was. But in some, whatever this double was, was eating. That was their department of assassinations. Their department. Leave it alone. Don't investigate. would know that Valerie Kostikov Army intel, intel units were told their assistance was not needed. They were going to send one to 200 men to, to Dallas. William McKinney of the 112th Military Intelligence Group at 4th Army Headquarters, Fort Sam Houston, went public. And he stated that he protested violently when they were told to stand down rather than report with their units for duty. So, um, and I think the third uh, evidence of conspiracy, you look at, uh, I don't know, somebody like David Montick, MD, PhD, he's proven JFK was hit at least four times and Connolly was hit at least once. One shot missed, that's six shots, not the official three. That proves conspiracy. And so, one more. Uh, his name is Bolton. Um, he was uh, Secret Service, the first black Secret Service agent that uh, Kennedy had placed in the Secret Service. Uh, he was going to testify in front of the Warren Commission and tell them that, hey, they had information about attempts that were going to be made in Florida and I think Chicago on Kennedy and before he was supposed to testify they put him in jail on some trumped up charges about some drug dealer or something that uh, he was getting kickbacks from or something like that and when he got out he wrote the book uh, Echo of Dealey Plaza and telling us his side of the story of what was going on because they wanted him out of the way so he couldn't testify and tell them about those other attempts and if if the word is correct that the driver and the his passenger the, in the shotgun seat they said they never turned around but in the Zabruder film you definitely see both of them turn around and the driver turns around two more times and he should have been on the gas getting the heck out of there but they, Kennedy had to die in front of that school book depository because if he had gotten to the hospital and they'd saved him, he would have said, yeah, I got shot in the throat and their whole thing would have fell apart. So. I believe it. I believe it. I, I wrote a separate book. I actually wrote three books, a trilogy of books, Surviving the Deep State under my pen name, Muir Taylor. And in my uh, chapter on this JFK situation, and I cover 
every aspect of the deep state. This is a very minor part of the deep state, JFK, but it was very important because if you understand that, you can really understand everything. Perry G Raymond Russo was an insurance salesman from Baton Rouge, and he was in Ferry's, uh, David Ferry's apartment in New Orleans in the fall of 63. He overheard a discussion of how to kill Kennedy, make a getaway. He said the plot involved triangulation, diversionary shooting, and to sacrifice one man as a patsy. And uh, Shaw, Clay Shaw, his involvement with the CIA speaks for itself. Later it was revealed after the trial, where he was found not guilty, of course, that he was a contract agent for the CIA. And uh, Lyndon LaRouche did a very interesting study uh, on the Permendix Assassination Bureau. It's a French intelligence dossier on the company, singled it out as funneling 200 grand to the OAS and the attempted assassination of de Gaulle, I think a year earlier. So I think it was funded in Europe. It was planned uh, in America. And I think the whole thing was CIA start to finish in terms of planning and execution because there's no other explanation. You had, you had about 200 witnesses killed within three to five years and the odds on that are one in uh, what a trillion so uh, that alone speaks for itself yeah a question is are we ever going to find out the truth or are they going to rip that band-aid off at some point or is it going to they're going to try to keep that under wraps as long as possible that's uh you know but it's all all of this stuff is this nation state where we're not supposed to know anything and all we are are just uh, their way of maintaining the status quo and the order that they want but don't tell the people that this is possible or that's possible just keep them in the dark and let them believe whatever they want to believe but don't let them have the truth they'll, they'll tell you the truth because they know you don't know the truth. And they, they told us the truth about the Phoenix lights. Uh, Kraft flew over Phoenix at eight o'clock and Ted Koppel gave me the opportunity to do a show about the Phoenix lights for Nightline. And I talked to Frances Emma Barwood, who was the councilwoman who, who uh, actually opened the, the can of worms on this whole thing. And she tells me how she was going into an open forum council meeting. And in an open forum council meeting, you can ask any question and they have to give you an answer within X amount of days. And she goes in and she, she says, extra, the TV show, literally jumped out of the bushes, stuck a mic in her face and said, is the council going to investigate the lights that flew over Phoenix? And she knew nothing about them. But when she got in there, what was her question? Are we going to investigate the lights that flew over Phoenix? And they went bonkers. She said, they said, let it go. You're opening a can of worms. Don't go there. But she kept pushing. So then she became a political cartoon in the, in the newspaper with the Starship Interflyers flying in one ear and coming out the other. And, uh, and but she, she, she stayed on her guns and persisted. And I'm like, and most people wouldn't, you know, really believe the stuff that's coming out of some of these things that people are telling us. Because she told me a second story. They always tell you a second story. She said that there was the uh, veteran cemetery, and they wanted to build a road through this, the cemetery, but the council said, no, no road will be built. Then she gets a call in the middle of the night, you better get out to the cemetery. So she gets out there with a friend. And here's these dump trucks, bulldozers, getting ready to build this road after the council said no. At first she said she thought that they could probably stop them. But then they realized they could get plowed under and nobody would ever know what happened to them. They got other people to help and they stopped them. But then in, the cemetery went from local control to national control. By the time it came back to local control, she said all this acreage was missing. And she said that the, I think it was the mayor, someone's a realtor, and they, this was prime land, so they were trying to get a hold of the land. And most people won't believe stuff like that because this is the kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes that. But she's telling me a story.